Okay, Mike Conley, take it away, Mike. Thank you, Ellis. Uh, next hour or so, we're going to be talking about uh, seawalls and uh, how to recognize issues, what to look for, things like that. It's a fairly basic understanding. It doesn't require a lot of training, although I highly recommend before you stick your neck out and do them, you get a little bit of training, maybe hook up with a seawall contractor and buy them lunch because uh, they can show you a lot of uh, interesting ways to correct things and so forth. Uh, we're gonna cover a lot of ground in an hour, so I wanna move on. So we're gonna talk about how they're constructed. We're gonna talk about the various components of a seawall. There aren't that many of them and the cap over time and function. Those other categories are, we're gonna to have to drop off today because of the time restraints. So signs that may indicate an old seawall, and there are a lot of them out there, gentlemen, a lot of them. Multiple cracks in the seawall cap and or multiple spalled concrete areas with exposed rebar. Those are sure giveaways that something's going on. Uh, erosion holes or washouts on the landward side of the seawall. Bowed seawall or cap. And seawall panels that are towed outward. A tow is the bottom of the seawall, the one that's the the end of the seawall that's buried in the in the soil. That's called a tow. And when it's bowed outward, that's a sure giveaway that the seawall is failing. So here we have anatomy of a seawall. Here we have our backyard. We have our house. Typically, seawalls are found in the backyard, probably 95% of the time. We have our mean sea level. That's going to be the average level of the water, the body of water you're uh, dealing with and where it, where it settles on average, not high, not high uh, tide, not low tide, but the mean. And that's gonna be important because you want your seawall to be a certain distance above that. And we have our uh, mean low water line, which is gonna indicate uh, or, or contribute to whether the seawall is stable at the toe or not. We have a mucky soil, which is the bottom of the, uh, the soil underneath the water, also known as the berm. Typical wall, anywhere from four to eight inches or more thick, depending on what its function is going to be. And typically, in probably the last 30 or 40 years, uh, seawalls have had caps on them, which is the top portion you see up here. And of course that needs to be stabilized so we have our tie rod or tie back, and that's going to be secured with a, what they call a dead man, which is a solid piece of something that's going to be buried in the ground. And all this is going to be predicated on, all of this is going to be predicated on whether or not uh, you have the, the space in the backyard to do all these things. Pilings, concrete or wood poles placed at regular intervals outside of the panel perimeter in the water to reduce movement of the seawall. Riprap, large size stones placed at the toe of the wall to stabilize its position and prevent or reduce erosion. Also, it can also be used as a buffer at shorelines in front of seawalls to break up wave action. And tiebacks or rods, as I mentioned a minute ago, steel rods or threaded rods connecting the seawall cap to the yeah. anchor. Here's an example of a little bit of overkill, but uh, it all depends on your budget, I guess. We've got a seawall that's being reinforced with uh, riprap. Usually you see one or the other, you rarely see them both together, but that's what they chose to do. This is a marina, by the way, so there's a lot of boats going in and out. Here's the original wall on a seawall that uh, was starting to fail over, uh, over a period of time. So they reinforced it with uh, corrugated steel panels pounded into the mucky soil and uh, then backfilled it with solid concrete. And as time went on again, rather than replace the wall and the corrugated steel, they added some riprap in front of the corrugation. But eventually this is all that have to be taken out and the wall replaced. What they're doing is they're biding their time and and saving a few dollars until that time comes. Beach riprap, you see that a lot from wave action. Storms come in, wash out the beach, and the riprap is protecting the road and the seawall on the left side. 
Okay, back to our backyard and our seawall. We have certain dimensions we should be meeting. And a lot of these things you're not gonna be able to measure because they're gonna be buried, but some of them you will be able to. We have our mean seawater level again. We have our mean low water level. We have our mucky soil, whatever it might be. And the seawall toe itself or the bottom of the wall. Seawalls are designed based on the exposure they have to water. And it's defined as either protected or unprotected. And that's definition comes from the Corps of Engineers who decide those things. And they've come to the conclusion that protected uh, soil is uh, has exposure less than two miles of water and unprotected has more than that. And the seawall will be designed accordingly. Typical seawalls are gonna, they're gonna strive to have them four feet above mean sea level. Now, of course, storms are gonna negate that, but for the most part, four foot is the average. You want your seawall and the top of your, of your cap to be at least four feet above the average sea uh, level. The toe, or the, or I'm sorry, the, the thickness of the wall can be anywhere from four to eight inches or more. Typical average is six inches. I see a lot of those in my market area, but uh, some of the older walls were four inches if they still exist and they're slowly being replaced. How much of the wall do you want buried in the mucky soil or the berm? You want to at least go three and a half to eight feet. Uh, in the old days, they went anywhere from two to four feet and that's proving to be uh, uh, not a good idea because of the fact that some of the washout of the monkey soil is causing the exposure of, of the bottom of the wall. And as a result, it's going to fail. So anywhere from three and a half to eight feet, depending on exposure. Dead men can be anywhere from 12 to eight inches wide and 18 to 24 or 18 to 42 inches uh, length long. And it's gonna be solid concrete with steel in it. Rebar is typically going to be buried into the cap and then buried into the dead man itself, in, in, uh, covered with a PVC pipe usually. You'll also find uh, uh, coated rebar being used, but that's relatively expensive, so you don't see it a lot in residential areas. Uh, that's the same kind of coated rebar you find on a bridge, for example, they use, but it's expensive, as I said. <clears throat> Walls from the 1940s and 1980s use threaded rods. Again, that would be in PVC pipe. The PVC pipe has to be buried into the cap and into the dead man a minimum of three inches so that water intrusion doesn't affect it. The angle of the tie rod is gonna depend on the clearance uh, or how much uh, soil we have in the backyard. Uh, relatively little soil in the backyard, they might even actually go underneath a swimming pool if it has one but that's typically not good design. And as the little box says, 10 feet to 30 feet is what they're striving for. A lot of backyards don't have 10 feet. Each end, again, three inches minimum. The wall itself is gonna be anywhere from eight to 16 feet, depending on how much penetration you wanna get in the monkey soil and how much uh, elevation trying to get above mean sea level. Filter fabric. Filter fabric is a material that is used to bridge the gaps between the seawall panels themselves in order to prevent uh, hydrostatic, or, or in order to allow hydrostatic pressure to pass through and maintain the soil on the landward side. Uh, strangely enough, filter fabric is not a requirement of seawall design which I find strange because seawalls are gonna wash out the soil over time, it's, it's almost inevitable, in, inevitable, but they don't require it. And there's two ways to apply it. You can, you can apply it uh, from one end to the wall to the other continuously rolled out, or you can just use the, apply it on the seams of the seawall panels. And that's uh, uh, with the stakes that are released two and a half inches wide, three quarters of an inch thick, and the, the filter traffic should be wrapped around each stake at least three times. And then uh, spanning the break between the panels, 18 inches on each side, which should make it a 36 inch panel. 
berm. Ground or soil which supports toe of the wall at the bottom may also include riprap. And the cap, of course, uh, we've been talking about that. You all know what that is now. Dead men, the same thing. Here's an example of a brand new wall being put in. You can see the tiebacks in the PVC. Uh, it looks like there's going to be about a 20 foot length on those things. And they're usually spaced every four to eight feet, depending on what's trying to be accomplished. You can see on the water side, there's a fairly large body of water here. So you want something pretty hefty to help uh, prevent any kind of damage over time. Filter fabric, that's what it looks like. It's basically a dense screen, which allows water to pass through and prevents the soil from continuing with the water, keeping it on the landward side, which is where you want it. Panel layouts, they usually make them on site. It's just costs uh, beneficial to do that rather than transport them. And you can see there's a lot of steel in these things and they're relatively thick. Here's an example of the steel, space six inches by 12 inches. They're stacked, separated by sheets of uh, plastic so they don't adhere to each other. And when they get the number they need poured and cured, then they're going to, as you can see by that backhoe back there, going to install them where they need to go. These are going to be 10 foot panels here. Interlocking panels, a lot of them design them that way. They'll interlock uh, so they don't want to separate at the seams. These happen to be six inches thick. Here you can see where the interlock is uh, a little bit different, but the same principle applies. Hey, Mike. Yes. When, when you're installing the dead man block, won't you be hitting the water when, when you're excavating it? Yep, you got to pump it out or pour it... Uh, uh, with a, uh, what's that? There's a term for pouring concrete onto water. Does anybody remember what that, that's called? It's called a jimmy or a jitty. Anyway, there's a way to create a form that you could put in water and by pumping the concrete continuously into it, the concrete goes down below the water line but starts pushing that water out of the way inside the form. And then once it cures, they take the form out and your dead man's ready to go. Are you talking about Tremi? Tremi, that was it. Thank you. I knew I had it there someplace. A Tremi. I don't see a lot of them anymore, but they still use them. They're still around. Here they are ready to go. They're getting ready to install them. And uh, you can see here where they've cut a notch in. That's because when they get ready to put that panel in, as that hits the soil or the, the mucky, uh, or the burn, the monkey soil or the burrow, it's going to want to push the panel to the one to the right of it and tighten up that seam. Spalling is one of the most obvious things you can find when you're evaluating seawalls and caps. Uh, what happens, of course, is pretty, pretty straightforward. Water gets in because concrete will allow water to pass through it over time. And what happens, water gets in attaches itself to the rebar, rusts out, and the rebar will start expanding and blowing those pieces out. And that's how you know that uh, you've got an issue occurring. It usually happens over a 15, 20 year period if the uh, walls and the cap itself have proper uh, coverage of uh, concrete. I believe the uh, cap should have at least an inch and a half on the sides and about two and a half, three inches of coverage, concrete coverage, top and bottom. Uh, back in the 1940s and 50s, they didn't put the dead men into the cap. They weren't using a lot of caps back then, actually. The, the, the cap concept didn't come back, didn't come around until the 1960s. So back then you had walls and then you had returns on the landward side. I'll show you what those look like in a minute. So when they ran their dead men or they ran their tiebacks, they actually ran them in the wall itself instead of in the cap to stabilize the wall. The cap is there primarily to align the panels so they don't go out of line. They don't separate from each other. Here's an example of uh, corrosion of steel, of course, blowing out all that concrete. 
they're trying to save the wall, give it a little bit more longevity by putting riprap in there. And that's only going to be a temporary fix. It's really not going to solve much of a problem. But considering the expense of putting seawalls in today, people try to do whatever they can to not have to replace it or fix it. Groins uh, in this country is a rigid hydraulic structure that built from an ocean shore or from a riverbank. It interrupts water flow and limits the movement of uh, sediment. Groins uh, run perpendicular to the shoreline usually, and they prevent or minimize erosion from occurring. Here's a good example of one right here where you've got a lot of wave action on the right side and you've got some beach going on here probably, maybe even some uh, boats being tied up. So that groin calms that water down as, a, as the waves hit that right side, that energy is not transferred to the left. So the water on this side is a lot calmer. Very common to see this. One end is usually attached to the beach, by the way. We're gonna skip that for a minute. Uh, here's a good example of an old wall from uh, the 1920s. And you can see where there's no cap on it. What they've done is they put returns here. And the returns are based on the, uh, uh, the height of the wall. So this wall happens to be about three feet high and you wanna go two and a half times on the return. So two to four, two to, two to four times rather. So whatever that, whatever three feet is, you wanna go six to uh, 12 feet of return. And you can see them they're spaced about six feet apart right here. Uh, you're not seeing the whole thing because most of them are buried under the soil, but what is exposed is visible. And this wall is uh, still standing today from the 1920s. That's very unusual. Caps have been used for about 50 years now. And for about 20, 25 years, they've been making them a lot larger. They've learned from their lessons, from their mistakes. These are the, the down here is the old size wall. The, these walls are good anywhere from 14 to 18 inches wide or in diameter, or 14 high rather, uh, 18 across, and they've gotten much bigger. This is probably more like 20, 24, by anywhere from uh, 24 to 28 inches horizontally. Much more heavy duty caps being used. <clears throat> Good example of one right here, 2007. Washouts. This is when you don't use filter fabric. Here's what happens. And it's almost inevitable for a wall without any protection against uh, soil being washed away. You want to watch out when you're walking along this line because you could break an ankle stepping in one of these. Oftentimes they're not visible until you step on them. Another example here, erosion, very common. This one is almost easy to miss. It's underneath the grass. See the soil back here? That's, that was on the landward side and it's being washed out in this crack right here because there's no filter fabric on the other side. And that's just gonna to continue to happen more and more causing this land up here to to finally collapse. Hey, Mike. Yeah. Um, here in the mid-Atlantic, our seawalls or bulkheads are built with piles, whalers, and wood sheathing. Can you describe how and why we do this? We rarely well, see concrete seawalls. I'll do one better. I'll show you some pictures. Awesome. And real quick, um, what's a jetty? Is that another name for a groin? Yeah. It is. It's a, it's a colloquial term that you use depending on what part of the country you're from, but basically it's just something that jets out of the water to cause, uh, uh, to prevent soil erosion. If you've got, uh, if you've got wave action, that's kind of running perpendicular to the beach instead of parallel to it, it kind of it slows that down. Uh, the Corps of Engineers in the last few years has wised up quite a bit and they're, they've come up with these concepts, which are turning out to be true, where jetties actually increase erosion instead of preventing it and we've got examples of that right here in the island i live on where they've got they've had jetties out for 20 or 30 years and the beach is gone and they're finding now by the by eliminating the jetties the beach is more stabilized 
And of course, what they're doing is pumping New Beach in every time because uh, tourist dollars. Thank you. Uh, erosion, also known as washouts, it may occur through, uh, through defective seawall joints or cracked panels. Uh, erosion is one of the most common issues of what you're gonna see probably that and cracks is, are the two things you'll see most often on a wall, which will be a tip off as to whether you want to look closer or not. Any solid base adjacent to a wall will cause voids to occur. Anytime you put something solid on the ground, there's gonna be erosion underneath that solid piece of whatever. When you see differential in your cap, it's not just cracked anymore. Now the wall's moving and that's a, a much more severe condition. See what I mean? Erosion on the landward side because of hydrostatic pressure passing through the, the, the cracks on the panels. Erosion pertains to the lawn. The leaning wall is due to uh, tie rod failure. You wanna be careful about walking these areas guys because they could collapse at any time. You could hurt yourself. Washouts, washouts, tripping hazard, solid concrete. That's what's causing it. If this, this piece, this slab of concrete wasn't here, you probably wouldn't have all this damage going on. Very common back in the 60s and 70s and 80s where people had uh, uh, boat dock uh, lifts, davits, to put them on a solid block because they had to counter the weight of the boat you were picking up. They've gotten away from that in the last 15, 20 years for that very reason, because of the erosion that occurs underneath. And by the way, you should never attach these to the wall, which they, they did all the time back then, because that puts a lot of load on the wall. It's, it's not designed to carry. This was an interesting wall. This is a wall I, of a home I inspected in Sarasota and it's parged. And you, this is a better picture. You see the curve right here? You see that curve? Any wave action coming into this wall is gonna wash up that wall and be curved back into the water instead of going over the, over the top. It's an interesting uh, concept, which I don't see anymore. And this was done in the 1950s. Uh, I think it's a great concept. Of course, it's labor intensive to try to get that curve in there. That's probably one reason why they don't use it anymore. Very large seawalls. This is the Gulf of Mexico we're looking at. It's more than two miles across. It's, so uh, the wall is going to have to be pretty beefy. But uh, here we've got, uh, this is from wave action. This is water lapping up over the top of the wall, over the cap and washing out all the sand. And you can see where it's exposed the dead, or the uh, tie rods, the tie back all the way around. This is about a quarter mile long wall, by the way. It's really, really expensive. And if you're looking at 150 to $250, a linear foot to replace the wall, you can see where this is a big investment. Long-term cracking, water got into the steel. That's an expansion joint right there. That's normal. You got wood piles here. Looks like a boat dock right there. You never, ever, ever should attach a boat dock to a, to a seawall or a cap and it's done all the time in my market area. Water side, landward side, homeowners are trying to slow down the process. It's not gonna work. It's gonna make it worse. Here's a, a good example of a tie rod that's in the wall itself rather than in the uh, cap from the old days. And you can see where it's sort of get very corroded because uh, they've got it on the salt water side and that's gonna affect that steel pretty quick. Uh, where's my, there we go. And of course, cracking going on. This is a relatively good size cap here, but uh, it's probably a replacement cap. This is probably the original wall. It was in good condition at the time. So all he did is replace the cap. And uh, now that's going this by the wayside with these cracks. And it's only a matter of time before these chunks of concrete fall off, exposing the steel 
And uh, it's going to be an ongoing process until they do something about it, which is probably going to be to replace the wall. Another good example, 1966, our tie rods are in the wall instead of in the cap. That's an existing wall with a new cap on it. So they're trying to salvage it. You can see where the mucky soil right there is actually exposed. Uh, that's not a good thing for seawalls to have no water at all like up against it. Uh, the mean uh, water level is way low for here for some reason. And that's probably contributing to the leaning of the wall and the, the breaking of the cap and the wall is, and the panels itself. The owner here in a home I expected, owner says there was nothing wrong with this seawall. So, and the seawall was not visible where the house was. It was a pretty good sized lot. And I had to walk uh, about 300 yards to get to the seawall. So I was in the house and I said, uh, I said, uh, what uh, kind of condition is the seawall in? He said, ah, nothing wrong with it. So I decided to go out and take a look and this is what I found. Can't believe what people tell you. Uh, another one, notice how thin this wall is. It's only four inches thick. They tried to stabilize it with pilings right here. And they tried to uh, fill the washout with uh, organic debris and uh, whatever this is. And of course, that's not going to work. Wall joint separation and washouts cause age, settling, structural failure, or perhaps insufficient berm at the slab toe. That's a, the bottom, remember of the wall. Uneven hydrostatic pressure is exerted on the seawall, especially at low tide. This condition is exaggerated during heavy rain. We're, uh, back, we're back to our backyard again, and we're going to look at some forces. We have a mean sea level, mean low water level, our soil, our berm, our tow, and we have hydrostatic pressure. Now, the hydrostatic pressure back here when the tide is in, is being offset by the water pressure on the water side. So it's kind of equalizing itself. But as that water level drops down to the mean water level, that hydrostatic pressure now is going to want to push that wall over, which is the whole point of having our tiebacks stabilize it. And of course, the cap is going to keep the panels all aligned. So we have to counter this hydrostatic pressure in the soil because it's there all the time. Every time it rains, uh, every time there's a storm and water washes over the wall and into the soil, that water is going to sit there until it has some place to go, which is why you need to be able to let it loose. You let it go through and hold the soil back. So hydrostatic pressure is invisible, but constant force created from water on the landward side of the seawall alleviated uh, through French drains, seams of the panels, and weep holes. Those how you address that. Here's a good example of some weep holes being installed on an existing wall. This looks like a pretty heavy duty wall. You can see where I have strong backs right here, right here. That's unusual, especially cement ones. So something is holding something pretty heavy back on the opposite side. And uh, they're putting the weep holes in in order to protect the wall so it doesn't fail. There's a close-up of what they look like. They're fairly, uh, fairly straightforward to install. They have a one-way flapper on them, allowing water to flow this way, but wave action cannot go back in. It closes the flap. Drain pipes. Drain pipes are not weep holes. You need to not confuse them. A drain pipe is a pipe through a wall that is serving to drain uh, the uh, the roads and streets, for example, when there's a lot of water, hard rain. Uh, in, in on, Am on Annemarie Island, where I live, the elevation is seven feet. So in a storm, when we have high tide in a storm, water goes through the drain pipes and comes back into the road. You see water gushing. So we're getting uh, Gulf of Mexico water right in our roads because of lack of elevation. But normally, in normal times, when everything is okay and the storms aren't around, the roads drain through the drain pipes into the Gulf. 
They're pretty easy to identify. You really can't confuse them with weep holes. Can you not put them in, uh, can you not put the one-way valves in the drain pipes? I would imagine the drain pipes are pretty good size. They're like 12 inches diameter. I haven't seen any weep holes that big. Uh, and the other thing is I've never seen it done. So I guess there's some reason why it's not real practical, mm, but it would be a good you. idea. Yeah. Uh, wash, washouts on the landward side of the wall uh, or backfill in the water on the water side all indicate loss of soil due to hydrostatic pressure. Uh, holes that have been filled with gravel, sand, concrete, or other debris are suspect to it. I've shown some examples of those. Uh, it's a pretty good chance a filter fabric or weep hole. Uh, weep holes were not used at the joints when you see that kind of damage. As I said, weep holes, I'm sorry, a filter fabric is not a mandatory requirement when you're building a seawall. I feel like it should be, but I'm being uh, cut, uh, probably a cost. They, they're going to run you, to put a filter fabric across a complete seawall, it's probably going to run you a dollar, dollar fifty a square foot. Uh, on top of the additional cost of the wall itself. So that's probably why money usually dictates what's going to be required and what's not going to be required. Uh, remedies, keep weep holes clear, install filter fabric at wall joints, reestablish berm when required with more soil or riprap, uh, sometimes concrete sacks. You can take 40 pound bags of, or 80 pound bags of sacks or concrete sacks, dump them in the water side up against the wall. The water's going to uh, cause the concrete to cure and harden so it's going to act like a stone and uh, that's going to stabilize your, your the toe of your wall for a certain period of time especially if there's been some lost berm down there. Install a French drain. French drain usually a two by two drain a two by two foot drain dug out behind the seawall lined with filter fabric and filled with crushed stone. The purpose to, is to facilitate water flow behind the wall and relieve pressure. It's important to know your market area and what is the norm for addressing these issues as well as accepted installations. I do not see French drains in my market area. That's some reason they're not very popular and people don't use them. Here's an example of one. We have our French drain crushed rock here. We have a filter fabric on the inside or the landward side of the wall. They've added some uh, Riprap for some reason, probably stabilized because the toe into the uh, mucky soil is not enough to stabilize it. So they're reinforcing it. French drain, weep holes right there at the bottom of the drain. Optional riprap, filter fabric covering, covering vertical joints. French drain, again, it's supposed to be a cure-all and in this case you have washouts anyway so the french drains are really not functioning uh the way they claim it would now either that's because it wasn't done properly to begin with uh they didn't put the weep holes in for example they didn't put the filter fabric in i don't know i, I can't see beyond the, the crushed stone but we've got some major issues going on here and it's only going to get worse wooden seawalls we have quite a few of these on bod bodies of water where there's not a lot of wave action. Uh, inlets, uh, uh, retaining ponds, for example, in uh, subdivisions, things like that, you'll see these kinds of walls. You can see where the water is very calm. We have our uh, strong backs, which is our posts. We have our uh, stiff backs, which is this right here, that right there. That's called, if, if it runs horizontally, it's a stiff back. If it's put in vertically, it's called a strong back. And then they use the two by 12 as a cap on top. Very rustic looking, people like them for that reason. Uh, this is on uh, Sarasota Bay. Uh, average amount of, of uh, wave action on Sarasota Bay. It's a pretty good size body of water, but it's not two miles across. It's a lot less than that. It's probably like three quarters of a mile. And you can see where the water line is right here. That's high tide on this particular house. And they have a tiny little beach for themselves when the water's out, when it's low tide. And it works for them. Not a lot of damage because uh, there's no wave action. These are mangroves back here. Mangroves have roots that help stabilize the beach area. You guys have mangroves up in your area? 
they have them in um, Virginia? No, not really. Oh, they're really common down here. Uh, this is a house I inspected. Uh, I was walking around the house doing my normal thing, and I noticed this this uh, fence back here I couldn't get around. And so I went ahead, I went back the other way and I did my thing and I uh, finished my inspection, but I was kind of curious as to why this is over, overgrown right here. So I walked down the street about a 16th of a mile, it was like 500 yards, I guess. And I walked down the street and turned the corner. And this is what I found on the opposite side of the wall, uh, my house. That's a, that's a, a seawall right there, what's left of it. And uh, you couldn't see it because of the fencing but it's starting to collapse. There's all kinds of vegetation growing, which is interrupting the uh, wall itself. This big old tree right here has got roots pushing the wall down. A lot of issues going on. So I, I was happy I took the, uh, the logical step. Stone sea walls, again, they're decorative. They uh, serve on bodies of water where there's no wave action at all. Uh, water's kind of stagnant. Uh, all these are just stacked together one on top of the other, one co course after another, and they've stepped them up. Each course they've stepped back another about an inch. So you have that uh, pyramid effect and it works. Here's a long view of it. This is water seeping through here. That's a downspout on the building. That's a pretty good sized building. That water's running down the soil and through the wall right here. That's why it's discolored. But notice how calm the water is. Concrete block seawall, not in very good condition as you can see. All they did was stack blocks up. On, <laughs> I don't know what they're trying to accomplish here, but uh, it's not a it was not going to work. Concrete bags, stack one on top of the other, wetted down so they turn to stone, and you have a certain amount of protection. Not a great way to do it. A concrete cap on a PVC, corrugated PVC uh, seawall. Don't have to worry about steel. You don't have to worry about corrosion. Uh, these are becoming more and more popular uh, as time goes by. A corrugated PVC, long view, large cap. This is a relatively new cap. Steel panels. They've been primed, but they're, uh, that's why they're gray looking, but they're actually steel. And you can see right here where there's not a lot of backyard. So where are you gonna put the, your tiebacks? They're gonna be relatively short tiebacks. PVC, uh, PVC seawall panels with threaded tie, wall, uh, tie rods separated four feet apart. And they're using a telephone pole as a dead man. Hey Mike. Yeah. Are those tiebacks steel? Yeah, the threaded rods, steel. Is it coated? Uh, these don't look like they are, but I have a hard time telling from this picture. It's not one I took. I don't see a lot of these uh, in my market area. We use uh, concrete almost uh, exclusively, but look at where they put the tie rods in. They got them in the wall, not in the cap. It doesn't have a cap yet. It's going to, but they put these in the wall and quite a bit down from the top too. I'm really surprised. I'm not sure why. And of course, when it's all done, they'll backfill all of this and uh, you won't be able to see any of it. Looks like a marina or canal. More threaded rods. Funky way of doing it, but it seems to work. Here, they've decided to use filter fabric. That's a good thing. And they've, for a cap, they've got uh, wood uh, PT and they haven't put the top on yet, but it's coming. And they've run their threaded rods into the cap is, which is the more modern way of doing it. Hey Mike. Yeah. Why is it better to put the tie back rods in the cap? Better stability. Better stability. If you got it in the cap, it's gonna stabilize the wall a lot better than if you got your tie rods into the panels. Because now the, the, the cap, without the tie rods under the cap is just a, an aligner, it's not doing anything else. The, the more angle you have between the bottom of the wall and the top of the wall and the diagonal bracing, which is the tie rod, you've created a triangle. 
And the, the greater the angle of that, the more stable it's going to be. Just basic geometry. Vinyl walls with Paul Deadman. Here's an old seawall cap, or an old, probably an old seawall. And instead of, you see where it's kind of curvy right there, they've, it's got some age on it. I don't see a lot of damage, but uh, it's probably due for replacement based on just its size and condition. But instead of paying to have it taken out, they just put a wall in front of it. And then your tie rods here are going into the, uh, the wood cap. Here's another example, a really old wall. You don't see these. I mean, it's almost like it isn't. It isn't uh, concrete. It looks like it's stone, but I'm sure there's concrete in it. No cap and it's failing. So rather than tear it out, they've just put a galvanized steel. Or is that aluminum? I think that's aluminum. That's an aluminum seawall. They put an aluminum corrugated aluminum seawall behind it to protect the soil, the property. And then whatever is on the seawall side, they're just going to let that go. Hey, Mike. Yeah. In, in that previous picture, will the old wall make the washout worse? Uh, I would, don't see why, as long as the new wall has got some filter fabric, which I looks like it might. I'm seeing some black here. So as long as they did this properly, this is going to be just a piece of uh, nothing. It's not going to do anything. Uh, it's no longer serving its function of uh, resisting the water because it's being protected. So they're going to backfill this and the wall's going to be buried. Nobody's going to know it's there. I don't see it doing any harm. Okay. Uh, you, you probably need to get permission for the state if you're going to do this sort of thing, however, because you're now you're intruding into the body of water. And that's a state uh, province. Okay. One, on the, one other thing. Are, yeah. the panels, are the panels water jetted in or hammered into the toe? Do you find a, a difference that is a very in... good point. That's a good point. And if you give me a minute, I'll show you. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, same wall, different angle. Just show you what it looks like. Looks like uh, the wall is turned into riprap here. And of course, you got some, when you see plants growing, that's not a good thing. I mean, something's going on. Corrugated steel panels with a concrete wall. Look at the backyard back here. How are you going to get dead men back there? Almost impossible to do. That's probably why they went with steel. I'm not even sure this is dead bended in. I think it might not be. They're relying on the depth of the toe and the alignment of the cap to hold this all in place. And you can see where there's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of soil to have to deal with. Uh, and hopefully they use some kind of drainage system on the landward side. Looks like a pretty calm body of water too. Uh, they put these panels together, the steel panels, they pound them in with, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of ways to do this. I'll show you what they look like, but they get interlocking rings right here. So they hold each other together by sliding together one at a time. PVC, same thing with interlocking rings. They slide each panel in. PVC wall with whalers, wood whalers in this case bolt it together. Aluminum with whalers. They got a high whaler and a low whaler. Normally you see the one, but in this case they went with two. Uh, it's part of the design and uh, they decided that's what they needed. And then we have our threaded rods. That's all good. This side is all going to be buried. Uh, galvanized corrugated steel from the 1980s. When you're dealing with brackish water, brackish water is a combination of fresh water and salt water. And the degree of salt versus fresh determines the brackishness of the water. And uh, you're dealing with corrugated steel here and partially salted water. So the corrosion is gonna occur right at the water line, which is what we're seeing here. And of course the level of water is gonna be fairly constant. There's no tidal effect here. It's just the body of water sitting calmly and uh, the water line is going to be there continuously 24 hours a day. So that's where it's going to corrode first and eventually fail. Uh, 
aluminum panels are prone to corrode, of course, and this particular situation is due to electrolysis. So something's going on that was not uh, properly bonded and causing this kind of damage. But you can see where the soil is fairly tight, except for the plants growing out of it here. But the soil is fairly tight. I'm surprised it's not falling out. Steel panels prone to corrosion due to salt water, of course. Okay, so how do they get them in? Well, they either they can either jet them or they can hammer them in. Those are the two most common methods. Here, what they do is they get a high powered uh, water pump. They put a piece of stiff PVC on it and they stick that into the bottom here uh, where the panel is gonna go. And as that panel gets put in place, they start pumping that water in there, loosening the soil so that the, the panel will fall further and further down. And when they reach the destination they're looking for, they'll pull it out and go on with the next panel. That's a good way to jet it. You can jet, you can jet panels like this with a hose, a garden hose from the house. They go in pretty easily. Hammering is uh, the other method they use where they'll they'll take a single uh, a pounding hammer or a dual pounding hammer, uh, or they'll take a backhoe and just pound them in with that. Then they go in fairly easily because you got to remember that mucky soil is not real dense. It's kind of kind of just loosely sitting on the bottom. It's really easy to penetrate. Here's a good example of a backhoe pounding in the panel. I don't think I want to be that guy in case something happens. Here they get ready to pound the panel in again with the backhoe. So we have our cap, we have a wall, we have a whaler, we have our tie backs, and we have our dead band, and that's basically the components. So why do seawalls fail? Oh, I got to pick up the pace, gentlemen. We're going to hit it a little harder here. We have hydrostatic pressure, as we talked about earlier, uh, causing, uh, and what, for some reason, water got into the rebar or the threaded rod causing it to fail. It got in around the PVC somehow, and now that tie back, tie back is no longer designed, working as designed, and that wall wants to fall over. Very typical for that to happen. Uh, causes saltwater intrusion, the cap or, or the uh, rods, uh, <coughs> which is why they protect it with PVC. Uh, with no uh, upper ro rotational support, hydrostatic pressure wants to cause the wall to fail. <laughs> uh, symptoms are deteriorated cap out of vertical wall panels, washouts, and wall failure. Remedies, a new poured cap and alignment of the wall panels if leaning and not if it's leaning not too much, they can usually recover that lean. Rods will need to be replaced to substitute with a whaler. A whaler is a steel or wooden beam that runs the length of the wall and about two feet below the top and maybe more than one. A whaler effectively replaces a failed tie rod system, but probably requires new dead men. 1950s, uh, there's really not a lot to salvage here. Uh, failed tie rods, the walls falling into the water. Toe berm failure down here, where they didn't get enough penetration or there were washouts that occurred because uh, people uh, tie their boats up to the dock and they want to rev their engines and that scours the bottom of the berm, causing the wall toe to be exposed. And once that happens, you have this scenario right here. And you can see that soil right there is coming from this side, the landward side. And it's only going to get worse. Eventually that wall is just going to fall in. Cause of toe burn failure, loss of supporting monkey soil, Seawall tilts out at the bottom and sometimes cracks or causes the cap to twist or crack. Loss of bottom wall support is usually due to wave action, running boat motors close to the wall, scouring. Here's an example of scouring. This is a waterway, People, the boats are coming in and out. You've seen those waterways where they post the speed limit to five miles per hour. Well, that's why, because of scouring. And if, if the boaters don't pay attention to those speeds, and they're running up and down at high high speed, it's gonna cause whatever is on the on the beach side or the landward side to be eventually washed out. Another example of scouring due to wave action. 
Tilburn failure of symptoms, a change in seawall height over time for no reason. Pressure on the dock pilings. Dock pilings are often attached to the wall or cap, which is why that we shouldn't. Both seawall panels are 10 feet long, so less than two feet or three feet of berm holding the panels in place may be the reason for the existing washout. They weren't buried deep enough, in other words. Remedies, reestablishment re of more berm, adding riprap or bags of dry concrete mix to help stabilize the wall bottom. Replacement of the wall with longer panels, adding an additional wall or piling on the water side to stabilize the original wall. We've seen examples of that. It's hard to tell here, but it's actually a tilt, a cap tilt, which means something's going on at the berm right here. Failure, waterline failure. That's when the water, the, the panels fail at the waterline. Good example right here. There's our waterline, panels failed. I don't think this, the backyard is as steep as it looks like. It's just the angle of the picture. Waterline failure, falling into the water. Cause, aging, corrosion of concrete, reinforcement uh, rod failure, uneven hydrostatic pressure on the wall. Seawall panels develop horizontal cracks, usually along the waterline, causing the panels to eventually break along those lines. Symptoms, look for cracks along the water line, accompanied by rust marks on the water side. Remedies, severe damage means seawall replacement, including cap, tie rods, and dead men. Minor cracks can usually be addressed by stabilizing the wall with piles, whalers, or helical anchors. Here's an example of a helical anchor on a steel wall. What they do is they drill right through the wall whether it's concrete or wood, put their anchor in, their helical anchor in, stabilize it, cap it off on the wall side, on the water side, and that stabilizes the wall. Here's a good side view. The penetration is gonna depend on where the stabilized soil is located it's at the, on, the, uh, on the backyard side. Helical tiebacks or anchors can be installed beneath existing structures, like swimming pools, for example, can be installed in limited access areas, like really tiny backyards, can be designed, uh, can be uh, designed site specific for existing conditions and intended leads, can be proof tested and immediately loaded, can be quickly and easily removed if necessary. Lifespan can be increased indefinitely with a sacrificial rod. Waterline failure. Massive washout right here, massive washout because the wall failed. Boat scouring. Uh, we talked about whaleys, you all understand what they look like. They're horizontal pieces. We talked about strong backs. They're vertical pieces, usually poles or piles. We poles. We all know what those are at this point, I hope. Uh, this is a house inspection my son and I did many years ago, and they wanted us to evaluate the seawall, not realizing that they had shrubbage all the way along in the seawall, so there's no way to get to it. We eventually found a way by walking around one of these corners here, I'm not sure which one we used, and walking on the wall, which, uh, is a relatively dangerous thing to do, but that's what we'd had to do. Carbon fiber seawalls, they're, they're coming on the market. They're very expensive. You don't see a lot of them because of costs. They're way more expensive than concrete, uh, but they're starting to be used in commercial applications. Here you can see where they're putting a carbon fiber panel into a seawall uh, to uh, stabilize it, to replace it. Here we have steel panels, right there, steel panels, and they're replacing those with carbon fiber panels. Carbon fiber panels. Massive job. All right, good deal, I'm right on time. Any questions, folks, anything at all? 
Hello, is anybody there? Does uh, carbon fiber panels last much, much, much longer than other materials? They do. They mess. They don't. They don't corrode. They don't uh, tend to want to break because they're flexible. Uh, there's no steel to worry about because the carbon fiber is the support itself. So right now they don't have a long life, a longevity span. That they don't have a long history because they haven't been around that long. Right. But in a few years, doing what the, the good things they're doing, we'll probably see more of them as the cost comes down. Are they usually um, installed as repairs or as an initial wall? I've seen them both. Okay. I've seen them used to both applications. Thank you. All right, anybody else? All yeah, Mike, one, one more thing. What's the yeah. average useful life of a seawall? Uh, 25 to 30 years, concrete. Concrete. Again, it gets, it's be, it'll be determined by wave action and whether or not uh, they're, they're probably installed, probably installed to begin with. That's gonna be at the berm at the bottom. That's where they goof up most often, uh, but it's gonna be 25, 30 years and then uh, you're going to start seeing indicators like cracks, exposed steel, spalling, uh, stuff like that. Gotcha. Um, Greg, did you have a question? I see your hand up. Can you get insurance on seawalls? Insurance. That's a good question. You mean like homeowners insurance? Yeah. I'm not sure. I've never heard of that. I don't know anybody of all the home, all the seawalls I've inspected over the years. I've never had anybody tell me, don't worry about the cost and insurance is covering it. They've never said that. So I, I probably have to say, no, you can't. Sorry, can you hear me? There you go. Yeah, I posted a comment about this um, in the chat, but do you refer these issues to um, to divers whenever you see them? issues like some of the uh faults we, we looked at the three major ones like uh, yeah I, I used to um inspect these as for years uh waterfront diving um and you can see some things from the surface but you know most of the issues happen above between below high water right and above low water and if it's not in that range you don't really know what's going on. So I'm wondering yeah. that whenever you see, do you, if, if you go there and it's high water or you, you don't see issues, do you just refer it then to divers or something or what do you do? Well, before I answer that, let me ask you something. In the walls, in the seawalls you've inspected over the years you've been doing them, have you ever run across a wall that looked pristine and turned out to be having an issue? Have you run For across sure. those? Really? Sure. What was yeah. the issue? What was the issue on the wall that didn't show up? deterioration of material that hadn't been realized above water. Like, for example, early signs of material deterioration that could lead to washouts. On the landward side? No, on, 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 below water on the seawall. Oh, below the water, okay. Yeah, like, for example, concrete spalling or wood. There's a lot of wood where I am, so there's um, a lot of, um, you know, soft wood or deteriorating wood, which hasn't sure. re resulted in subsidence of the soil on the landward side. Gotcha. I have, uh, I, I gotta be honest with you, I've never run across a wall that I couldn't diagnose based on what I can see without having to go in the water. So I guess to answer your question, I, I would say, no, I don't dive. Uh, if I see something that I, I'm suspicious of and it's below the water, I might recommend further evaluation by a seawall contractor. But I probably in my career have to had to reference that had to refer that maybe three times. Any other time besides those three, something was going to show up that I could see that would indicate to me further evaluation. Yeah, I would recommend if if it's high water and you can't see the condition of the wall below that, right? That it's a good idea to have to recommend having uh, divers or revisit at low water. Gotcha. I understand. Good presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone Mike, else? Do, you any, do you have any standard disclaimers that you put in all your reports? Of course I do. I mean, uh, we got to have those. That's we're, we're doing a visual inspection, regardless of what kind of area we're inspecting. It's always a visual. I know guys that 
put, I, I do a lot of pools and spas. We have a lot of pools and spas. I got guys in my market area that put wetsuits on and dive into the pool they're inspecting. I think that's a little overkill. <laughs> I don't do that. And I could pretty much see everything I need to see. Now I'll tell you, I have a scope. I have a three foot scope, which is like a, a, a diving mask, except it's three feet long and it's got a lens at the bottom. And I can stick that thing in the water and see pretty much anything I want in that pool and I'm, and I'm dry. So why these guys do that, I, I guess they just feel like it's being thorough, 